I'd now like to invite Tim up to talk to us. Tim is Professor of Psychiatry at Concord Clinical School, the University of Sydney in Australia. He's a Clinical Academic Director of Collaborative Centre for Cardiometabolic Health in Psychosis, CCCHIP as we know it locally. CCCHIP is a key player in Sydney Health Partners, a multi-regional NH and NMRC translational research collaboration. Professor Lambert has spent 25 years researching, teaching, and providing clinical services in the area of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, with a particular emphasis on treatments and patient outcomes. He has a portfolio of interests in translational aspects of clinical psychopharmacology and neurosciences, spanning clinical psychosis research, outcomes research, health service delivery models, clinical training, and multimedia-based education. His primary focus at present is on developing development of integrated care models of care for the chronically ill in a multi-system comorbidity in persons with severe psychotic disorders. And I think it's a, a fitting follow-on from, from the other speakers we've had. Welcome. So this is an interesting sort of start, really, because it says that the National Mental Health Commission has identified poor physical health of people with mental illness is a major issue and really a, a disgrace, a sort of public health disgrace. And, of course, nothing gets done. There's lots of bleating and so on. But this is the same headline that was around 50 years ago. It's not a new phenomenon. It's something that's been going on for a long time. And as you'll see, lots of things are trendy. Um, looking after first episode, people with psychosis was trendy for a while. And some people might think the physical health comorbidity in people with severe mental illness is trendy. Trouble is, it's actually getting worse. And as you'll see, it's gone beyond a sort of a public health issue. It's now just sort of embarrassing. It's sort of Trump-like. So here's good old Australia, ABS data. That's how long you're going to live if you're a baby boomer, roughly. But it shows... On the left, what's happened since uh, Federation? So our longevity's gone up, and for your grandkids, I guess they'll be living, sort of, I say, 2.5 years longer every decade we go forward. And um, for, for most of the audience here, the people who are not millennials, um, then, you know, we expect to live to about 80. Back in the days of Federation, life was hard and then you died, and... Has it improved for those with mental illness? And the answer is no. That's being generous. What you see there is the average age of death for people with severe mental illness, and it really hasn't improved. In fact, I'm fibbing a bit with that line because that slope is negative. It's going down. And that gap, that longevity gap, is actually increasing. And there's no doubt about it from an epidemiological point of view. It's not just an impression. Um, it's very, very clear that the the gap is widening. And when was this first put together? Well, if we go back to 2000, so about eight, ten years ago, um, you can see by that stage, these are comparable states to the sort of health systems we have in uh, Australia, vaguely, and we can see that people are already losing about 25 to 30 years of life through preventable cardiovascular illness at that time. And that was a long time ago, and things have been getting uh, a lot worse. There have been two mortality studies in Sydney in people with severe mental illness, and they are indicating that the actual age of death is progressively uh, becoming lower and lower. So what does all that sort of tell us? Well, it, it tells us that we should listen to our colleagues in uh, the Scandinavian countries, I just would love to have a data set that I could work on where you could sort of say to it, tell me the number of people who stood on one leg and farted on a Tuesday afternoon, and they give you the stats. It would just come out. So they can actually tell us, going right back to the 90s, there's the uh, mortality rates for the general population going down progressively as we have better eating, better exercise, and so on and so forth. But for the people, I'm using schizophrenia here, but uh, talking about all severe mental illness, 
the actual mortality rates are going up. And those curves have not reached an asymptote yet. That's the worrying thing. They just continue to go up. So why is it then that people are dying of usually coronary uh, artery disease is number one, cardiovascular disease in general number two, and of course diabetes feeding into that as part of the diabetes epidemic. Third is respiratory and so on. Now, this is uh, sort of obvious. If we talk about general practice, general practice can't come in and save us. Um, you know, you haven't got enough time to do that. So why is it that people ignore the people with severe mental illness? They are difficult, there's no doubt about it, if we listen to the wisdom of our colleagues. Probably the start of all this is just nihilism, in uh, the sense of what's the point of trying to do something for people with severe mental illness? They won't take medicine, they won't take the treatments we offer, they never come to appointments, and with this sort of thinking, we go on to the inevitable uh, result of that, which is neglect, nihilism and the neglect, the two ends that drive this whole phenomenon of early death. People don't like the word neglect because it sort of sounds harsh. I don't know a better word of describing it. If someone sits in front of you uh, who's quite obviously at risk and you don't do anything, I suspect that is the definition of neglect. So, what do we do about it? About over the last uh, 15 years or so, more recently here in Sydney, we've developed a, a, a multidisciplinary approach to caring for people, and I'm not going to go through it in any depth. And lots of people like to say they've got multidisciplinary teams, but it doesn't sort of work like that in reality. What we have here is we take the most severely ill people who are schizophrenia, bipolar, and severe mood disorder, and recent figures from... Um, the Maudsley suggests that could be somewhere between 3.5 and 4% of the population. It's not an insubstantial amount. And uh, we get them to come along on one afternoon and they will see a cardiologist, an endocrinologist. They will see a psychiatrist with medical, uh, more extensive medical training, psychopharmacologist. They will see... Um, they will be screened for sleep disturbances and they will be seen by the professor of sleep medicine with me in a satellite clinic. They'll see allied health. They'll see an exercise physiologist and dietitian. They will see a dental team because of the worry about inflammatory cytokines from people whose mouths look like some sort of horror movie. All of this in one afternoon. It's obviously quite hard to organise. Why would you want to try and cram so much into an afternoon? Well, perhaps um, I won't show you the structure of the community parts of it, but so here's a sort of a, a range of, of people that they're going to see. Now, this is the archetypical New Age Australian male coming to the clinic. Here he comes, I hope. So he's a bit slow, there he goes. And he's whipping around and seeing all those people. Now, the reason I've drawn that, and he seems to be going quite fast, because that's a relative time dilation effect. Uh, because if that person was in the community, he wouldn't see everyone in one afternoon. So he sees the endocrinologist who says, I'm afraid, yes, you, um, your HbA1c is about eight. And you really you know, need to do something, and you probably should see the cardiologist. I'll make an appointment for you. And, of course, as it goes into the uh, booking system and it has a mental health unit record number attached to it, suddenly the person mysteriously won't be seen for six months. And then, of course, by the end of all that, none of the people are talking to each other, and there are numbers of uh, medications that are banging into each other, and there are implicit hierarchies cardiologist is much more important than endocrinologist. You better just remember that. And at the end of this are the people who do the actual work, who do the allied health people and the lifestyle changing people. The majority of people do not complete any cycle of uh, workup because it's just too long and involved. And that seems to be probably one of the best ways of dealing with it is to get everyone together in one afternoon. 
But the key to this is this picture you see here where the eight people involved in estimating what's going on for that person come to a synthesis that afternoon. So there's no hierarchy in who's more important than anyone done by email or telephone calls. What we have is a group of people who will synthesise what needs to be done and work out the action plan that day. And it is, as you can see there, the, what we've got the dietician, uh, I can see the cardiologist there, can't see the endocrinologist, he probably went off to get a sausage roll. So, um, but everyone else is there. Now, the service as we're describing it here is set up really to deal with the barriers that exist to the treatment of medical comorbidity in this population. Um, you know, this, these barriers have been well described, we've been writing about them for years. And we look at the barriers in terms really of its service structure, the illness itself, and the patient's response to it. And just looking at some of the service issues here. Um, without going through them, I'm sure you can read, and you can always go and read the article, but the, the, the key I want to stress here is that the barriers to actually getting adequate uh, sort of a physical examination, a history taken, are enormous. And that's not only at the level of the general practice, it's at the level of uh, all physicians' colleagues who just don't really want to deal with the mentally ill. And um, one of the ones I'll pick out here from the list, the list you can see is quite extensive, non-psychiatric doctors are reticent to treat those with serious mental illness despite relative deficits, blah, blah. Now, um, our colleagues up in Queensland have been doing some access to services. So you come into the front door of casualty. We just heard the story about the homelessness problem, which is a real problem. And two patients are identical. One is mentally ill, one is not. Both have acute coronary syndromes. One goes upstairs to the cath lab and gets stented. The other one goes into the outpatients if they live. Wonder which one has the mental illness. And Steve Kaisley and others have been following this sort of absurd uh, mistreatment of the mentally ill for a long time. I'm afraid we can't hide from it. And so part of the uh, Sydney Health Partners, the NHMRC Translational Centre that we're part of, is to try and translate the knowledge we have in medicine into the world of those who are dispossessed of access to that knowledge, which is the, those with serious mentally ill. And I won't go through that in any detail, but it's, it involves a sort of complex interaction between advances in information technology, clinical services, and it has to live outside of the vertical silos. It has to live outside of psychiatry. Psychiatry is still wondering what this new electricity thing is. It's a bit complicated. We'll stick with candles. And we're not quite in medicine, even though we're mainly physicians because physicians don't like mentally ill people. Oh, it's, it's all so difficult. Where do we live? So it's called integrated care, I think, nowadays. So uh, let's just look at some brief data just to show you some of the concerns that we have and why one of the problems is that because people are used to the general population and saying, well, I'm not going to worry about your cardiovascular risks until you're in your 40s and so on, despite what we're told to do, Let's have a look at just the rate of diabetes. Even if we were to say Ozodiab is a little bit uh, you know, out of date already and needs, the numbers need to be reconfigured, and I'm sure Jonathan Shaw would agree, but whatever you figure you come up with, at a minimum, the rate of diabetes and prediabetes in this population is three to five times higher, always has been, and always will be. But it's not just the rate of diabetes. When people come to our clinic and we diagnose their diabetes, the worry is they've probably had this for a very long time. Now, if in the average population, the 50% uh, of people have, uh, have already got sort of vascular change, they've got retinopathy signs and so on, what do you think it's like for people who've never had a physical examination who come along after and they've had diabetes for 15 years? And that's the concern. It's, it's the sort of a, the delay in identifying people. So when should we be identifying them? Well, let's have a look at some age phenomenon. So here's, I've just picked out some 
random stuff from our data systems. What I'm showing you in these slides is looking at the incidence by age stratum compared to the Australian Bureau of Stats data, and I've reconfigured the way we measure things to be in concordance with the ABS, because we measure things quite differently than, than they do. And as you can see here, if we just look at HDL, I mean, from, you know, for lipids we're talking about HDL and, and trigs are the things that we get interested in, we're not so interested in LDL, it's sort of that gets done, but these are the things that we're turning out in our multivariate models to predict poor outcomes seem to be very much more important. But you can look at that and you say, huh, oh, so you don't actually have less risk than the general population until you're 64. And for those that don't know the reason, you see a lot of stats where physical comorbidity Im improves over, the, over 60, five in mentally ill people is not because there's a magic improvement, it's just most of them are dead. Don't forget the average age of death is 51. So anyone who survives beyond that has really good genes or they have lots of money. So they live longer. But you can see those risks for HDL certainly start quite young. Let's have a look at uh, their, uh, their trigs. And again, we'll see a very big uh, gender, not gender, age um, effect here. So when should we measure their lipids? So it's the young people who have been on treatment for no more than a few months that start to have an enormous rise in, in terms of dyslipidemia. When we started this down in Melbourne, uh, whatever it was, I don't know, 15 years ago, I couldn't, and I worked at EPIC, which is the first episode unit with Pat McGorry, I couldn't get the doctors to measure people's lipids. I said, these are young people. They won't have anything wrong with them. But of course, when they started doing it, they found out they were shocked. So and this picture I'm showing you there is absolutely the same in terms of relative risk for nearly all the parameters we measure. And we measure a lot, over a thousand sort of columns of data in SAS from every afternoon's clinic. A lot of information in there to start the modelling. But the key here is this age effect is there for nearly anything we look at. And the key here is you can't wait until they're presenting with signs or you think, oh, people won't really have anything wrong with them till they hit their 40s because things are starting from day one. So the final slide then is very simple. It really says... What is this disruptive innovation of which this conference is supposed to be about? Well, actually, it turns out it's a business term. So I, like my colleagues, had to look it up. An innovation that creates a new market. Hmm, I presume that's a service model, providing a different set of values which ultimately and unexpectedly overtake an existing market. So is this model that we've put together overtaking the existing market? No, because not all innovations are disruptive even if they appear to be revolutionary, though doing the bleeding obvious doesn't really sound revolutionary to me. But the slow uptake of our model, despite support from the CEs of all of the major uh, health districts in New South Wales, what does that tell us? It, it suggests probably that we're not a disruptive innovation, we're just simply a sustaining innovation. And a sustaining innovation is one that allows people to quaintly say, isn't that nice? what they're doing, and the, the status quo continues and the predominant model continues in the background. The trouble is, for the severe mentally ill, there is no current model. For every 100 contacts a GP has with a person with schizophrenia, eight might involve physical health. Our population figures, which we have now for Sydney Local Health District, suggest 70% of patients have dyslipidemia, 55% we know have either prediabetes or diabetes, hypertension in about 40%. Wherever we look, the prevalence is incredibly high, and as you saw from those figures, much higher than the uh, population rates. So, hmm, the, the model is not going to be served by passing it on to general practitioners who are colleagues and allies, but they can't do it. I think it's a whole of medicine approach that's going to have to work to try and replicate the type of model we've put together here. So my question to finish this off really is, does this allow 
the sort of nihilism and neglect to remain a pervasive barrier to care. And how many of you would be happy to say when someone asks you at the pub, what uh, do you do for a job? I'm in the business of neglect. I'm a specialist in it. I'm not sure any of us would like to say that. Um, well, you could. It might give interesting results. And on that point, I'll end. Thank you. Here. We don't have the nice table with the white cloth and the chairs, but so let's just wander around. Um, so can I have a show of hands? Who, who thinks we have uh, forgotten mental health? Now, oh, have we had a reduction? <laughs> it looks like people have a reduction in hands going up, which means that people are, I think, agreeing with you. So um, thank you, Sky. Have we got a it's not, can you speak, it's not. Oh. Hello? Yes, yeah. thank you. I've just got a pharmacological. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name's Ari Tagalaitis. I'm a neurologist and a general physician from Sydney. Um, I've just got a pharmacological question. Given that we've got so much uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes in these patients with... Um, more severe mental illness. I wonder about the contribution. I mean, there are other lifestyle uh, things, no doubt, but I wonder the about the contribution of our pharmacotherapy for these uh, mental illnesses and whether um, that, in fact, is slowly killing these patients through overeating and uh, all the associated... Uh, Features. Uh, I mean, you can't help but notice um, most of these patients are overweight morbidly in a case where they've been on the medications for years and have been ironically compliant with their medication. And, I, you know, we talk about our pharmacotherapy being so much better nowadays because of the absence of rigidity and Parkinsonian symptoms... But I really wonder how much better it is if we're giving them these long-term um, uh, metabolic uh, kind of syndromes. Tim, I yeah. think suggest this to us. All right, I'll go and put my um, psychopharmacology hat on, which <laughs> has been most of my life. Um, everything you've heard about the benefit of second-generation antipsychotics, that was a pretty good ruse that lasted for quite a while, wasn't it? Trouble is, it doesn't seem to be supported by more modern ways of doing meta-regression uh, and so on. In answer to your question, there's no doubt about it. When kids are first becoming unwell with bipolar or schizophrenia or even severe depression and they're in their late teens or early 20s for men and, say, mid-20s for females, when you look at how rapidly, for example, dyslipidemia and weight gain occur, that is absolutely a pharmacological effect. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. We know the, the models to predict it. We've developed a model, which is somewhere in the pharmacological press at the moment, in which we've modelled it, and I can actually give you a number, which is a probability of a person developing metabolic syndrome with the medications. So we sort of know that, and it's all very predictable, and it's lovely, it's nice, and a bit of science-y early on. Two years in, I cannot keep a medicine in any equation. It just drops out every time. What's it being swamped by? It's probably being swamped by the lifestyle problems. These illnesses are illnesses of social decline. And, of course, you know, we're, even the sort of things are in space looking at Earth, and they see all these yellow arches for McDonald's, whatever it is, where do they see them all? They see them in the poor suburbs where our patients tend to drift down. So the, the pharmacological drivers are absolutely critical early on. Do people get better if we change some of these dreadful drivers once they're ill? The answer is they won't lose weight without services we don't have in this country. But, yes, their lipids will improve. And so that does have some effect. But I'd have to say the amount of variance that's explained in any model of 
the metabolic and cardiovascular problems we see once people have been established in their illness is very minor. But at the beginning, it's nearly everything. And one of the great problems you, you're sort of uh, you're helping to point towards is the, the, the sort of unscientific, senseless polypharmacy that psychiatrists in, indulge in. Um, there's a new diagnosis that's been invented called schizoaffective disorder. It was a real diagnosis, and I'm speaking as someone who was on the, you know, part of the writing thing for ICD-10, so I do know a bit about it. And we used to say that was a diagnosis when you couldn't decide, short-term diagnosis. Now everyone has it. What does that mean, a diagnosis of a schizoaffective? That means you go on to valproate and you go on to olanzapine combinations. Both of those are the most orexigenic substances we have in neurology and, as far, and psychiatry, as far as I'm aware. So you add those things together and you have no hope. You never needed them. So the idea here is through sort of uh, polypharmacy, we're going to create more problems. I don't think we are creating these problems in as much as we're accelerating their severity. So yes. Yes. So I'm Irene Wagner. I'm a geriatrician and I provide a geriatric medicine consultation service to our inpatient psychogeriatric unit. And one of the problems that we have are there are a number of patients that basically just refuse to take any of their medications in terms of their cardiovascular risk factors. You know, to the extent where, you know, one woman had a obviously had coronary artery bypass grafting and had a lovely scar down her sternum and she just said, nope, that's not from cardiac surgery and there's just nothing you can do. So sometimes I find, you know, even when we do try to actually improve the general health of these patients, they're their worst own, en they're wor own, own worst enemies. Can I answer that one? What do you think? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I do agree, uh, but I, I just want to address a little bit of a myth here. One of the things about mental illness is that um, people think that it's pointless doing things, the nihilism part, because of poor adherence. Well, if you look at the literature over the last X decades, and you look at, let's say, a group of people uh, from the gastro area, the renal area, general medicine, well, it doesn't matter. And you look at their adherence to cardiovascular medicines, antihypertensives have probably been uh, uh, researched the most. Mentally ill people are right on the median. They're right in the middle. They're no different than anyone else. And if you came to one of our clinics, you would see these very sort of unwell people who are in the community. They're terribly interested in their physical health. They just, when I go up to the endocrine um, outpatients, sometimes do a bit of stuff there, and it doesn't seem any different from that. If you talk about their mental illness, whoo, you're in trouble. I don't believe they've got it. However, what a, a lot of time we spend on is plotting and scheming of how are we going to get them to services, how are we going to get the medicines into it. And so what we'll do, I think, in general, not just for the, the mentally ill, but it also comes for all people with chronic diseases, the future is going to be about the mode of delivery. And where we're going is we're trying to get as many handles as we can on long-acting forms of medicines, including things that are no longer going to be with us for, for dyslipidemia and so on, but certainly looking at Bigerian and other things where we can just um, give weekly injections. So the problem you have is a, a problem we all face. Adherence is the biggest enemy we have, but it's not insurmountable. But it does occupy a lot of our time, like... Thank you, Tim. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I'd like to thank the speakers for a very interesting afternoon and um, something that is very passionate to my uh, current work in the area of integrated care for socially disadvantaged. So I'd put it, put it together for our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>